the seed of Vishnu's descent, Varaha, in the womb of Mother Earth. He set up his capital at Pradyotishpur and wedded Maya, the daughter of the king of the Dharma. Bhagadatta and three other sons were born to him. By his mother's request, Vishnu gave Narakasura the boon of never being defeated by any god, demon, or human being. By the strength of his boon, Narakasura became more and more strong and oppressive, and by establishing an alliance with a powerful demon such as Kansa, Janasandra, Kalayavana, Nikumba, Hansadibhaka, and Poundraka, he intended to bring the entire world under his domain. He began to cause trouble to sages and holy men. He did not even hesitate to steal the earrings of Aditi, the mother of gods. Being emboldened by this, he also started snatching away the daughters of the gods and holding them captive in his prison. Coming to know all of this, Yamuna, the daughter of the sun, realized that it would not be possible for the females of heaven to maintain their chastity unless they could bring the matter to the notice of the Lord's earth, Lord of Earth, the King of Dwaraka. In her mind, she offered herself completely her mind, body, and soul to Dwaraka Nath. Then, when Yamuna was fearlessly enjoying a ride in the air in an airplane, in her own inner region of Surya Lok, the great demon Narakasur disguised himself, entered Surya Lok, and caught Yamuna by the hair. Yamuna, who had surrendered her life to Sri Vasudeva, cried out in fear, and her panic stricken voice created turmoil in the heart of Govinda. His mission was to rid the earth of its burden, instantly used the Sudarshan chakra, slew Narakasura and saved his beloved Yamuna. Out of gratitude, the sun god then offered Yamuna to the hands of sweet Varaka. On the other hand, dressed in a blue color that puts the Indranilamani jewel to chain, decked with the beautiful ornaments, though being perfectly beautiful, all by herself she became she becomes Sri Radhika's friend and serves her in the form of a Manjari, a young maid. Also, she is supremely fortunate by being able to offer the divine couple the opportunity for sporting in her waters in the riverine form. In the, in the temple here, there's also she's also worshipped as the beloved of Sri Krishna in Dwaraka. <clears throat> Jai Radhe. A little bit the nightly Harinam are still in the bones. <laughs> hmm? <clears throat> uh, so, just a little commentary. Actually, not necessary. It's also explained so nicely how this Himalaya pilgrimage takes place, how they are visiting this incredible place of Yamunachi, which my heart also longs for, dipping into this hot water place at the snow peak level. Mm -hmm. Something very just brings to my mind just a few days ago, we got hot water from the springs of the Anticucho uh, in Ecuador at 3,800 meter height, uh, there's a Eco Yoga Ashram there, and we were supplied some of the hot, hot waters from the from the uh, from the volcano, Antisana. So, so it's not very much. It's in the Andes, but it's also a hot spring. Right there, where the condor condors fly. Mm. 
Namam Vishnu Badaya Krishna Bhastaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Uravani Pichanine Nirvishesha Chunyavati Askachari Satharine Following in the footsteps of the great Acharyas, we can see that this holy land of Vrindavan is entrenched deeply with the Leela of the Himalayas as well, because that's where Yamuna Devi was born. And this is something so wonderful, how the whole Vedic culture is like connected one Leela with the other, the Rama Leela, the Krishna Leela, he was Hanuman, there's Yamuna, there's Dwaraka and Mayapur, everything is like inter interrelated and uh, one pastime brings another pastime to be thought about. So even when you go up to the Himalayas where much past Rishikesh and uh, all the Ganga Saga, no, no, excuse me, Ganga Saga is when the Ganga goes to the ocean, you know, all the way, this, this incredible distances where the Holy River makes its presence. And then when you go up to the Himalaya where Yamunotri, Gangotri was actually born from the mountains, that is, very in life. You see, the divine pastimes of the Krishna Leela and the whole Vedic culture is very, very in intensively nature-bound. Then down is the Holy Land, the Holy Land of Tulas. Mayapur is the Holy Land of Mahamudra. Connected to his neem tree, that's why he's called Nimai Pandi. And in the same way, everywhere you go in India, every time you see some holy places, some holy mountain, holy river, holy, um, holy trees, holy herbs, holy types of prashada, like Kirakshona Gopinath is famous for its Maha prashada. Also, Lord Jagannath's temple, which is even mentioned in the Shastras somewhere, is already, it's very, very famous for its Mahaprasad, Jagannath Prasad. So, what I just feel to celebrate is that a beautiful integrity of, of this uh, wonderful Vaishnava culture background. I mean, like take Vrindavan. Vrindavan is a big area. There's so many square kilometers. A large area. And in all that area, there's here one Krishna Lila, there one Krishna Lila, there one Krishna Lila, there one Krishna Lila. They're all synchronized. They're all... They are all... And they're not only synchronized in a... In, in a sense that they are on some map, but they have the respective folklore. Like they have the, in Varshana, they have the holy, in Varshana is a big, big festival between Nandagram and Varshana. And then it moves to Yavat, and then it moves to Dauji. So it moves, the whole pastimes, they move all around this area. So you could definitely say it's a very living culture. People are, vibrating and having the bath of this of this lila going on until today pretty amazing right? especially if you consider that buddhists and who, who else were in the influence in the matura region and you know, there, there were so many so many difficulties they had to face britishers rose was a british uh, district manager of course, he himself became like a devotee, and he actually did 
uh, some good work for the region. FC Gross or something like that. But he, he, he wrote the Matura memoir on that, something like that. A very important book where he collected historical information on Braj and Brindav and Matura and all this and that. So it's it's just like it's a it's a it's a like the Vaishnava history, the Rajput history. And the Muslims attacked the Tambots and the Rajput kings fought the Muslims and took the deities into protection into Jaipur, you know. This is history, this is like art, you know. And then you see the temples they made, those temples is actually astonishing temples, no? Everything in and around Bindavan is really astonishing. Krishna's astonishing. From the very beginning to the very end. And he's still very astonishing as his historical Leela extends towards all directions, you know. So when I'm thinking about the mountains of South America, I'm actually thinking of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it connects me right in like plucking you in you know? <laughs> now Lord Chitan is here and he is exhibiting his past times and it's really wonderful. So who knows what what will be done so that the mad people in the mad world of today can awaken to the divine and beautiful reality of Look. Speak a little bit more of the pilgrimage. Then, when Yamuna was fearlessly enjoying right in the air in an airplane in her own in a region of Surya Lok, the great demon Narakasura disguised himself, entered Surya Lok, and caught Yamuna by the hair. Yamuna, who had surrendered her life to Sri Vasudeva, cried out in fear, and her panic stricken voice created turmoil in the heart of Govinda. So he killed Narakasura. <clears throat> Besides all this, in the cave adjacent to the Yamuna temple at Yamunotri, I saw a fruit eating sadhu, and in another cave below the Dharma Shala lived a reticent sage. They lived here for more than six months a year during the winter. They all pervading snow covers everything. They came down. <clears throat> all of this was told by our Pandichi. Jogen, Babu, and Bolanat would that day worship Goddess Yamuna and fed Brahmins. they had worked out the details on the way while climbing in the mountains with Bandaji. They, 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 they began to make arrangement for the five Brahmins to each for Yogananat and Bolanat and only for the Moniman Har. Jogan Babu would cook and Man, Moni Mohan Bolanan Chavila would serve. They would they made puris, potatoes, curry and sweet rice, which they had brought with them, milk from below. <clears throat> all the all being busy with preparing for the occasion, I could conveniently slip away. Something very interesting here. In India, when you serve sadhu, sadhu seva is when you feed sadhus. And this is taken very serious. You know, if you 
invite sadhus for a meal. He makes sadhu seva. You know, you are behaving like God is visiting your house. And you, you have to follow so many different special elements in this connection. For example, after you feed somebody in, in that, not only that you fed him, then you also give him a donation because he made so much effort to come there to accept your invitation. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very, uh, everything. I mean, the way you sit them down, you feed them, the way you offer them, the way you keep serving them while they're eating, <laughs> the way you wash their hands, everything. Wash their feet when they come. Yes, it's, it's, it is so, such a complex, loving, and uh, and very uh, extensive effort they're making. You can see, hey, they are they're really trying to accomplish something, or they have a very deep and and even when you go to a normal family, you are invited in a normal family nowadays in India. Many of these elements are still there. Like, the, even though the host may be an, an for a famous guy, important, he will not eat while the visitors are eating. He will there be, he will be looking, do you need something more, and like this. Only when everybody's finished everything, then they will eat, and you will not see them when they eat. They disappear. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> she just got me. I said, what was that, you know? <laughs> that sound you made was like unique. <laughs> so. Oops. Okay, it's funny, it's funny, Lisa. <laughs> That's <laughs> Thanks for saving her <laughs> and me. sat down in a cat <laughs> and she wouldn't have had an escape you know <laughs> poor cat <laughs> she made a very unique sound <laughs> yeah it was it came on time you know <laughs> Well, it was like it was between laughter and and alarm. Mm -hmm. Did you also make that sound? <laughs> okay, I think that's enough for this morning. We don't know too much of this Vedic culture. It's very deeply in the heart of those who are born there and educated by it. It's being lost more and more nowadays, but it's still there. It's uh, incredible. feeding sadhus. And Prabhupada taught it to us by feeding everybody, you know. That, that's, uh, you can see Prabhupada, if, if you want feeding, feeding is not, you shouldn't think condescendingly when you feed somebody. You shouldn't think, oh, I was so generous, I fed somebody. No. You were so fortunate to be able to serve somebody food. That's the way to think about it, and that's the way they do think about it. They feel so fortunate. Like we were at the ethics experience yesterday when Harish invited us. No? What a wonderful way of serving and, you know. Oh. 
राधे श्याम राधे श्याम राधे श्याम At this time, we have to explain the card because now we have the iPad closed. So this is 80, 40, 40, 40, 40. So there's just like 